Good morning. We would like to start. So good morning all to all of you. And welcome uh, to this session uh, in the topic of uh, medicinal chemistry and computer aided, computer -aided uh, drug design. I'm Professor Metal Zilberman from the Biomedical Engineering Department here at Tel Aviv University, and I'll be chairing uh, this session. We are going to have here uh, four exciting uh, talks from uh, both industry and academia. And our first speaker is Dr. Roy Amir from here, from Tel Aviv University School of Medicine. And the topic of the presentation is designing micellar uh, nanocarriers with high molecular precision. The stage is yours. All right, thank you very much, Maital. And, and just to be uh, more precise, I'm coming from my faculty at the School of Chemistry and part of the Blavatnik Center for Drug Discovery. And today I would like to uh, describe to you our research on uh, micellar nanocarriers and specifically using high molecular precision when designing and making such systems. So it's common knowledge that a lot of uh, the drugs that we're using today in the clinics tend to be low molecular weight hydrophobic molecules, which means that very often we encounter problems with poor solubility. They can get clear very rapidly from circulation, which limit the amount of time that they are present in the body to do their function. They can get degraded before they reach their target, and very often they're non-specific, which means that they are harming also uh, normal and healthy cells. So one option is, would be to try and device or, or try to design better drugs, but another approach that we're using in my lab and in many other labs around the world is to try and use and de um, design delivery platform that would allow us to improve the solubility of this drug. We potentially can encapsulate or load nanocarriers with drugs in their core, allowing to a much greater amount of drugs to be delivered in the body. Such uh, nano assemblies are known to have long circulation times in the body, which means that we can prolong the time of their uh, stay in the body. They can protect the drugs from degradation and potentially can also be targeted to the uh, site of disease. And it's uh, becoming very interesting in the, in the past uh, uh, 10 or 20 years or even more to use amphiphilic block of polymers that can spontaneously self-assemble to give such nanostructures that again have a hydrophobic core in the center that can be used for encapsulating or loading drugs. Now it's clear that if we want to design such delivery system, we need them to be very stable. So they will be able to travel through the body while they maintain the drug inside. But you also need to think on a release mechanism because if the delivery platform you've done or you made is not releasing the drug, then we really haven't helped anything to, to push uh, uh, the therapeutic efficiency further. So we need to think on some release mechanism. And ideally, I think we would like to have the hydrophobic part to become hydrophilic. This would lead to the disassembly of the micelle and releasing hydrophilic polymers that would be able to extrude more easily from the body, so we're not leaving any leftovers from our delivery platform after it's completed its uh, job or task. In the literature, there are a lot of a, a very broad field called stimuli-responsive polymers, polymers that can respond to changes in the environment, to the change in pH, change in temperature, or change in light. And very often, these are uh, reversible changes that can allow one to transform its amphiphilic block of polymer into a double hydrophilic one. But specifically in my group, we're very interested in the use of enzymes as the stimuli or, or to explore whether we can use enzymes as the stimuli to, uh, to trigger the release, um, the release mechanism. And why are we so interested in enzymes? Well, enzymes are highly selective. They have catalytic capabilities, which means that we don't need a lot of enzyme in order to uh, activate such system. They are already present in the body, and most importantly, we are aware of overexpressed enzymes that are uh, overexpressed in specific diseases or tissues. And if we could design a system that would respond to these overexpressed enzymes, then we could achieve the triggering mechanism already at the site of disease with the hope of, of creating or bringing higher selectivity. And you can see here an example of the overexpression of catepsin B in breast cancer tumor is not only overexpressed in the cells, it's also being extruded to the extracellular matrix, and such enzyme can be a great target for designing such delivery platform. And then for the rest of my talk, my enzyme is going to look a bit more like this, like this pac with sharp teeth. And this is because when I first made this presentation, 
Uh, I was spending the afternoon with my kid and trying to explain to them what I'm doing in my work and what we're doing is things that uh, then an enzyme can come and cleave them off. So that's why I have sharp teeth, so you can cleave the groups off. So ideally we wanted to design an amphiphilic block of polymer that would spontaneously self-assemble to give micelles or other type of structures. We can load this with drugs or probe molecules and then the enzyme, we want the enzyme to come and change the hydrophobic part into hydrophilic so the micelle would be able to fall apart and release whatever it was carrying inside. Now, because we were very concerned about the selectivity of the enzyme and the fact that if an enzyme looks at such a polymer, this group might look very different from that one, we decided to come up with a, a better or, or more advanced molecular uh, architecture. And we went to design a work with this, with this hybrid structure that contains a linear hydrophilic block, but our enzyme responsive block, the hydrophobic part, is a dendron. And having there a dendron, with hydrophobic end groups and cleave that are linked through cleavable, enzymatic cleavable bonds to the dendrum itself, give us very high molecular precision in the design and fabrication of such molecules. We have all these different parameters, such as the type of the cleavable bond, which would determine the specific enzyme that can activate the system, how many end groups we have, how hydrophobic they are, and other parameters, including changes in the hydrophilic block that we can do. And all of these are supposed to provide us with a wide array of, of different molecules of different parameters that would allow us to then understand or study how these di uh, different molecular uh, structures influence the self-assembly and the enzymatic release later on. We are definitely not the first one to introduce this hybrid structure. This was actually introduced back in the uh, early 90s by uh, Jean Frechet, Craig Hawker, which I had the pleasure of doing my postdoc with, even Gitzel and Karen Woolley. And later, different groups around the world have been using this hybrid of a linear polymer with a dendrimer, uh, uh, such as Paula Hammond in MIT, Takuza Ida in Tokyo, these guys in, in KTH in uh, Sweden. And in all these papers that you look on, on the hybridizing a linear polymer with a dendrimer, it immediately emerges that this, the having a dendrimer here basically give you higher molecular precision and allowing you to later carry on better uh, structural activity relationships. So we we'll go to our structures. We start with a polyethylene glycol, which is FDA approved. We're doing a first a allylation reaction and then a thiolene reaction, introducing an amine group. Then we start branching out and we chose a chemistry that is orthogonal. So we have the, just the acid creating these amide bonds. And now we have the two triple bonds. And we don't need additional activation steps or deprotection steps. We can immediately go to the uh, growth of the second generation by using a thiolene, chemi a thiolene chemistry, the addition of two tiles to each triple bond, and we can immediately jump from two end groups to four end groups within a single step. At the next step, we can uh, mask basically this hydrophilic moieties at the end of the dendron with a hydrophobic uh, group, which is a substrate for an enzyme. In this case, this phenylacetamide is a substrate for an enzyme called penicillin geamidase that can break uh, this bond. And I'll show you in a second this moiety here that have a very unique a signature in, the, in its absorbance really helps us to understand the system better. So we have these structures schematically look uh, uh, illustrated here. Just show you very briefly in a proton NMR. I'm aware that most of the audience are not organic chemists, but trust me, this is one of the best NMRs of a polymer that you'll ever see. So the high molecular uh, precision and symmetry of the NMR really make the NMR look almost like the NMR of a small molecule. Again, in the field of polymer chemistry, these are un unseen, uh, poly unseen animals, beautiful ones. Then we want to understand how, whether these molecules, whether these amphiphilic polymers self-assemble. We use uh, different techniques. We are encapsulating a solvochromatic dye called uh, Nile Red. Basically, uh, tell this uh, dye is highly fluorescent in a hydrophobic environment and it loses its fluorescence and becoming almost non-emissive in a hydrophilic environment. And as you can see here, if we change the concentration of our polymer, going from very low concentration at a certain concentration, around 10 micromolar in this case, we have an exponential increase in fluorescence, indicating that the nitrate has found this hydrophobic core in the environment, in the solution, and its fluorescence is turned on. It tells us at what concentration we're starting to see micelles. We can use, uh, we're using dynamic light scattering and TEM to characterize the sizes and the shape of our structures, and we're also using NMR, but this time in water. And this is the exact same structure that I've shown you before, that had this beautiful spectra with all the peaks. And now we can see that all the peaks that came from the dendron disappear. Basically, whatever is in the core has very low mobility, very short relaxation time. The peaks get broadened until they disappear. A great indication for us for what's in the core and what's in the shell of this spherical structure that are formed in solution. 
Next, we wanted to see if an enzyme can do something to these uh, 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 assemblies. And so we went to the DLS, we start with big structure, we add the enzyme, and we are very happy to see the disappearance of the bigger structure and formation of smaller ones. Indicating that the enzyme is breaking the micelle, but we can still tell you how many groups were cleaved, if at all. We then wanted to see if this uh, uh, decrease in the size will also be accompanied by the release of a cargo. So we again, we start with the Nile Red, and we're going to add the enzyme now to a micelle that contains the Nile Red. And if the enzyme can break the micelle, then the Nile Red will be forced to move back into the aqueous solution and the fluorescence should go down. And this is exactly what we saw here. This decrease in fluorescence indicating that the micelles are breaking apart and that the dye again is being forced to move back to the polar aqueous environment. Then we are very uh, happy that again, with the high molecular precision of our structures really allow us to uh, even use a, a normal fa a reverse phase uh, HPLC and we can see that we're getting very nice and, and sharp peaks for a polymer. So we have our starting material right here at T0, and then we add the enzyme and we keep on following the degradation of the, uh, enzyme, of the polymeric uh, uh, platform. And we can see the formation of peaks with shorter retention time, which we correlated initially with the cleavage of the hydrophobic end groups one after the other. The more groups the enzyme can cleave, the, short, the more polar the structure gets and the shorter re the retention time. And we isolated these peaks and went to a, a MALDI TOF MS, getting the mass spec of, of each of these peaks. You can see the comb like structure that comes from the polydispersity of the peg itself, with the difference in the repeat unit of 44 mass unit. But if we look on the average of each of these peaks, we can see that it's being shifted as we go from the starting material into the intermediate. It's being shifted by exactly 120 mass unit, corresponding perfectly to the cleavage of one hydrophobic group after the other. This gave us an amazing uh, uh, opportunity to actually draw specific molecular species in the solution in every given moment, something that is very is usually not uh, possible for polymers due to their high poly, uh, due to the polydispersity. So we can see here that we can follow the disappearance of the starting material, formation of a monocleaved intermediate, and then formation of a doubly cleaved intermediate, which seem to be a poor substrate for the enzyme. And if we compare this result to the result of the fluorescence right here in the uh, dashed line in black, we can see it was actually enough to for the enzyme to cleave one group to completely disassemble the micelles, as we can see by the decrease in fluorescence of the encapsulated Nile Red. With this, I told you in the beginning of my night, in the title of my talk, the fact that we are uh, looking at molecular precision, and then we decide to take our dendrons and create a small library of free structures in which we change the length of the hydrophobic end group. So we have here esters that can be cleaved by an esterase, and we have what we, uh, a short chain that came from hexanoic acid, so we have four hexyl groups, four non-anoic, so three carbons uh, longer, and then four undecanoic groups with two more carbons for each chain. So we have a series that our peg is exactly the same and the hydrophobic groups are being increased in this direction. When we went to do uh, this critical micelle concentration to measure the CMC of these micelles, we can see that the undecanoic forms micelles at a slightly lower concentration, but we don't see any big changes between the four hexanoic and the four nonanoic structures. But when we went to the DLS, we actually saw very big differences between, the different, between these three structures. We can see a very a, a sharp increase in the size of around seven nanometer between each series, which we did not understand initially. We went and do, did some uh, SACS experiments with a collaborator in the physics department. And we actually both confirmed that the, uh, the increase in the sizes, you uh, increase the length of the hydrophobic end groups. But we also found out that the reason for that is the fact that we have different aggregation number. In the case of the hexanoic, we have 30 hybrids per micelle, going up to 50 and going up to 90 uh, monomers per, or polymers per micelle. So this small change in hydrophobicity is causing a big change on the self-assembly and aggregation of the micelles. With this, we went and, fo and followed the degradation. We can see that here we don't see any intermediates. The starting material is being directly converted to the fully cleaved structure. And we can see here, if we follow this uh, a graph here, that the one with a uh, four hexanoic group got cleaved very fast, while the other two, the one with the non-anoic and hexanoic, were very stable under this low concentration of the enzyme. When we increase the concentration of the enzyme, we can see that the non-anoic start to cleave faster, and if we increase it even further, we can see a full degradation of the one with the non-anoic. 
And these are results should be a, a seen as, as very interesting because if you think about it, the degree of polydispersity that we introduce by changing the length of the groups of the hydrophobic groups is actually smaller than the polydispersity of the peg itself, which means that the system is very, very sensitive to very small changes in the structure and this high molecular precision of the denimer actually allowed us to see it and extrude it out. We then even decided to push it uh, later, but before that, we had to make sure that the reason for this change, this huge difference in enzymatic reactivity, does not come from the quality of the enzymatic substrate. It could be that the enzyme simply does not like to cleave the undecanoic chains. So we made small dendrons, which we call the G0, basically, because they have only one branch. And these, because the hydrophobic part here is so small, the critical mass concentration is very high, and then we can, means that we can measure them, the enzymatic degradation in concentration that are way below the CMC. And when we did it, you can see the results right here. We were actually very surprised to see that the enzyme cleaved the undecanoic chain faster than the hexanoic and then the, uh, then the nonoic and then he hexanoic, indicating that the undecanoic is actually the best substrate. So if you ask the enzyme what it prefers to cleave, it prefers to cleave the longer hydrophobic chain, the undecanoic one. However, if we take the same structure and put them way above the CMC, so we have mices and we are now limiting basically the excess of the enzyme to the hydrophobic end groups, and the excess of the enzyme is now dependent on this exchange of, of monomers inside and outside of the solution. We can see a mix, a mix of the uh, trends, and now in this case the nononoic uh, is becoming faster. We then pushed it even further when we went and took a hybrid with four hydroxyl group and did the last step of putting the hydrophobic end group with a mixture of two groups. So we have the hexanoic and uh, nononoic, and we are, suppo we are expecting to get a, a random distribution of all possible uh, uh, structures. So one with four hexanoic, one with four nonoic, and everything in between. And we could actually inject them to the HPLC and separate and isolate. We did not isolate them, but we can detect each one of them. And very amazingly, because these structures are different from each other by only uh, uh, three carbons on a, a polymer that weighs more than six kilodalton. And when we follow this degradation of each of these peaks, you can see it have a very different rate, degradation rate, which again is, is amazing if you consider the fact that we changed a polymer that weighs something like 6.3 kilodalton by three carbons. By, and, and you're getting such a, a change in the rate. And I think this should make all of us reconsider the effect of polydispersity when we're designing an amphiphilic block of polymer or, or any molecule that can self-assemble and aggregate because the aggregation is highly influenced by hydrophobicity and this would highly influence the enzymatic degradation. With this, we have managed to publish in the last couple of years a lot of uh, papers, again, on the fundamental understanding of the uh, self-assembly and degradation. By that point, we wanted to see if we can make what we used to call a, a smart polymers, even though I may, may argue with you that a polymer that can respond to pH, to a change in pH, is not really smart. But let's say we want to make them smarter. And what I mean by saying make them smarter is that I want the polymer to be able to report its structural change. I want the polymer to tell me whether it's in an assembled state or whether it was degraded and went to the uh, disassembled state. In order to do so, we took our molecular design and introduced another moiety right here, a linker that would allow us to covalently bound, let's say, a fluorescent dye with some intrinsic spectral properties. When we put these molecules into water, they should self-assemble. And the fact that the dyes are exactly in the interface between the hydrophilic and the hydrophobic part means that in the micelle there would be the interface between the core and the shell. And when you put dyes, in uh, fluorescent dye, in very close proximity to each other, they tend to interact, and the type of interaction depends on the type of the dye. We can think on dyes that uh, have a very small stock shift. These dyes would self-quench each other. Or mixing a dye with a dark quencher, these two scenarios would lead to micelles that have no fluorescence. And or alternatively, we can use dyes that form excimers or mix two dyes that form a thread pair. And these two scenarios would give us mice that have a different spectral signature or a different color than the uh, color of the initial dye. Then we're going to add uh, the enzyme. The enzyme is not going to do anything to the dye itself. It's cleaving the hydrophobic end groups from the other side of the polymer. But the polymers become hydrophilic, they disassemble, they get further away from each other, and the dyes can no longer interact. This means that we are going to go back to the intrinsic spectral properties of the dye that we use to label. With this, I would like to show you, even though we've made a couple of examples, 
I would like to show you only one uh, uh, example. And this is the use, we use a, a coumarin in order to label our hybrids. This is the hydrophilic precursor with a distinctive uh, and typical uh, uh, fluorescent spectra of uh, this coumarin derivative in a slight blue in around 480 nanometers. And when we went and did the mice, the, the one with the amphiphilic structure, and we got the mice, we could see a very significant red shift of the uh, fluorescence. And this is indicative of again, eczema formation between these dyes, again, in the, uh, exactly the interface between the core and the shell. It was interesting to see that even if we went below the CMC, we measured the CMC by null red to be around 3 micromolar, that even if we went below the CMC, we could still see this longer wavelength that is indicative of the fact that the polymers are staying together and they're in their assemble or aggregated state. This system is, is, is very nice because you could basically plot or calculate the ratio between the two peaks, the one of the assembled and the one of the non-assembled, or the one that do not form excimers, and get an indication for the assembly state or the aggregation state of your uh, system. So you can see here that for the hydrophilic uh, uh, precursor, this ratio stays the same through a wide range of uh, different concentrations. And if you look at the amphiphilic structure, we can see that they start at the same point. But at a very low concentration, orders of magnitude, two, roughly two orders of magnitude below the CMC, we can already see the micelles, the polymer coming together, starting to aggregate, and starting to form the structure in the solution. So we, we took this uh, system and we added the, the enzyme, and you can see here that we, the longer wavelength fluorescence went down and the shorter one came up. As again, the polymers are getting a cleave, they become hydrophilic, they diffuse away from each other, and the system can tell us that it was activated. We can also uh, uh, have great correlation between the change in fluorescence and the HPSC result, in which we directly monitor the degradation of the polymers and the cleavage of the end groups. With this, I would like to uh, take you to the next two slides, which are unpublished uh, uh, data that we uh, obtained very recently. And using, similar, using a similar system that is uh, labeled also with a coumarin, and changing different hydrophobic end groups, we could basically look into, you can see some uh, uh, cell imaging coming from HeLa cell after one hour of incubation. So we, if we look on the, just on the fluorescence, uh, you can see that there's a lot of uh, uh, labeled polymer outside. But interestingly, we can, at each of these pixels, we can obtain a spectral uh, uh, image or get the, the fluorescent spectrum. And we can see if we then plot this ratio of the wavelength that corresponds to the mice to the wavelength that corresponds to the monomer, you can get this uh, uh, scale. So turquoise and, and turquoise goes for the micelle, and then uh, uh, purple go for the monomer. And we can see that outside, all the structure are in the micellar form. And once they get inside, we can start seeing that on the membrane and inside, we are starting to see the polymers in their monomeric form. This is very interesting because it allows you basically to follow the internalization of the micelles and understand whether they go inside the cell as a micelle or whether they fall apart and go as monomer into the cell. And I would like to show you a series of structures we've done. This is our hydrophilic precursor. You can see that it's purple. So it's in the monomeric form inside and outside. And we, here we start increase, uh, introducing hydrophobic end group and increasing the hydrophobicity as we go along this direction. These are images after 10 minutes of incubation. And these are after 30 minutes of incubation. This is the zoom in for this. And basically what we see is that if the hydrophobicity is relatively low, the micelles are, the, the polymers are in the micellar form outside of the cells. But basically once they see the cells, they go inside the cells through the, uh, through the membrane. It seems that they go to the ER for some co-localization experiments we've done. But this is reversible. If we wash the cells, then these polymers would go out. If we increase the hydrophobicity, and here we have four chains of uh, octanoic acid, we can see a, a huge incorporation of the polymers into the membrane. So they basically in intercalate into the membrane and then go inside both as a, a free polymer, but also as micelles. And if we go to these ones that have a C11 chains, then basically we can see that the micelles are very stable and they go into the cell as a micelle, go through endocytosis. And then after half an hour, we can see that again in the endosome, some of the polymer got a, some of the polymer got degraded and, and started to fall apart. And if we had drug inside, they would probably start releasing the drug. With this, I'm doing on time. Perfect. Okay. So as part of the organizing, I'm, I'm trying to rush things up to make up for the time. So I hope that I managed to convince you that again, using high molecular precision, 
really allows you to dig into the details of, of the mechanism that you're trying to follow. In this case, we were trying to follow and understand the enzymatic degradation of such polymeric uh, micelles. And uh, by using a dendrimer, basically we can tune, I didn't show you how we tune the number of end groups, but I showed you how we can tune the length. But tuning the length over the, over the number of end group really allows us to dial in the uh, stability of the micelles toward enzymatic degradation. And these self-reporting micelles, I think, are providing an exciting opportunity for a physician in the future to being able to follow their therapeutic uh, system and the delivery platform and know where and to what extent they were activated. We are now uh, working on uh, combining a system that would respond to two different types of stimuli, such as the use of a, a light and an enzyme or the use of reduction and enzyme in order to uh, create more uh, mice that would be more stable until they're activated by the first stimuli and then the enzyme would come into place. I'm very happy that the f our first work on this uh, subject uh, got uh, the cover, got into Jackson, got also the cover. And I was twice happy because I drew this uh, enzyme with teeth, you know, once from scratch. And having your uh, artwork appearing on the paper of Jacks, on the cover of Jacks, was very nice for the first uh, paper that came out from my group. With this, I would like uh, to thank my uh, group members, uh, col collaborators, uh, a lot of collaborators around here, and also uh, abroad, especially uh, Lorenzo Albertazzi in, uh, in Barcelona, who's done all the biological experiments. A funding agency, the, the Nano Center, the ISF, uh, Alon Fellowship, uh, and the uh, Dama, which are an agriculture company, but apparently there are some similarities, at least from the perspective of an organic chemist, between drug delivery and agriculture, except the scale is, is very different. Usually your biological collaborator wants few milligrams and the agriculture company wants few kilograms. So a part of this, there are very similar challenges and the Blavatnik Center for uh, uh, allowing me, again, to uh, be the academic head of the medicinal chemistry and, and produce and try to push the uh, discovery of new drugs here in, the, in campus and uh, beyond. And you, for your attention, I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Well, this, um, this specific polymers have esters bond, so they could basically be cleaved in, sorry. So the question was what cleaves the, the polymers inside the cells for these very stable micelles? So first, the, the polymers have ester bonds so that can be cleaved by different hydrolytic enzymes inside the cells, but I can't really tell you whether they got cleaved or got disassembled due to interaction with the membrane of the endosome or, or proteins that are inside. Because right now I cannot distinguish, I can distinguish between assembled and disassembled. I cannot distinguish whether it was disassembled just because, again, it got trapped with other hydrophobic areas or whether it got cleaved. This would be our next goal to design a system that can distinguish between the two. Uh, could you comment, please, on the mechanism? Of So depending on the what we see from this preliminary result, is that depending on the hydrophobicity of the amphiphilic block of polymer, this would determine the stability of the micelle. So if you have micelles that are not that stable, so they're stable in solution, but when you put them in the cells or you put them with other proteins such as uh, bovine serum albumin or other proteins that have hydrophobic areas, then the polymers would disassemble and then they penetrate into the cells directly through the membrane. So they infuse into the membrane and pass to the other side and then go to the membrane of the ER. If the, micelle, if the hydrophobic part is longer, the mices become more and more stable, and then eventually you get mices that go in only through endocytosis. If you have a structure that's kind of in between, then you can probably do both things. And this is what we saw with the C8 chains, that it both penetrates the, the membrane, but also enters the mices. So you can have kind of two mechanisms 
for, for such polymers to get into the cell. It would be very interesting at the next step to try and tailor your internalization mechanism to a specific drug that you want to deliver, whether you want to deliver it through the endocytosis or directly through the, uh, into the cytoplasm. Okay, thank you very much. Right, thank you.